And then there is one particular example of a billiard. It sort of plays the role of harmonic oscillator for chaotic dynamics. When they teach you mechanics, they first teach you Hooke's law that if you push, you get the same force back proportional to displacement. And eventually, you learn about harmonic oscillators and, and you learn about. Uh, ellipses in a phase space in one dimension and harmonic oscillators because when you're doing clear mechanics course you sort of never leave these harmonic oscillators because when you're doing Keplerian things it's still true and when you do quantum mechanics you're still doing harmonic oscillators when you do quantum field theory you do harmonic oscillator for every degrees of freedom plus perturbations so lots of physics stays at harmonic oscillators when you're studying chaotic dynamics you need something that's as unlike the harmonic oscillator as possible. Harmonic oscillator has this property that it has extremely boring dynamics. You specified a point, it's on ellipse, and you know everything for all times. And there is no instability to any perturbations. If you move a little bit uh, further away, you just get another circle or ellipse. So it's very, very simple. It's foliated, etc. Chaos is the opposite of this. And billiards are just incredibly nice intuitive way to do this. So a harmonic oscillator, or yeah, if you're a physicist, if you're a biologist, then it's called a Sicheria coli, a bacteria that's in your gut. You know, you use one simple example to try to illustrate all the relevant uh, phenomena in your subject. And for us, for chaos, this particular example came very late. I mean, my colleague Bruno Eckert pulled it out in the 80s, and he was actually a student at Georgia Tech at some point. So, no, I don't know. It's actually related because Georgia Tech has always been very strong in nonlinear science. And when you look at this system, What does dynamics look like? Dynamics says I have disks and you make them unit radius to make your life simpler. So disks of unit radius. We will, if you only have two, it turns out it's very boring. And not much happens unless you're, you're doing quantum mechanics in which case it becomes interesting. But for classical mechanics, very boring. And uh, you take two unit disks. And now what can happen? I start on one. I shoot. I didn't want it to be quite that flat, but I shoot. I hit the other disk. And I actually know the normal immediately, because the normal is just the radial distance. So for disks of uniform radius, I know the normal. So I just have to produce this. Now, if I take some other trajectory, it's maybe better to see. This line intersects the circle twice. And to find this intersection, you just solve quadratic equation. So you take a line, you take a circle, you only have to solve quadratic equation, that's why you have two solutions. You take the one that's closer to the original disk and discard the other one because it's impenetrable disk. And you immediately know everything else because once you have this point and you have the radius, you can compute this angle phi. So you know both the distance and you know the uh, reflection, specular reflection, just by solving a quadratic equation. So it can be simpler. So you can really do this. And so that's the dynamics. Now the linear stability, I told you you know everything, because linear stability has two components. As, as you fly, 
then uh, the neighbors separate proportionally in time. But that separation is just proportional to this length, and you know the length. That's just the flight time. So you know uh, what happens to delta x, the configuration thing at time t. Let's say this one and this two. Uh, let's say this one and this two. Uh, one to two flight time. Time is the original thing. What about specular reflection? That's trivial because just the radial distance, and you know this, this radius, so you know how to compute sines and cosines here. So all you need to do is at point of impact, you have the radius going here, you have the incoming things, and the phi is the same, incoming and outgoing. So you know cosine phi. And that's all you need to compute the defocusing at the scattering. So when you read the book, it's two by two section, and that presentation follows Sina and Bunimovic. Bunimovic is our colleague here. He was part of his PhD thesis. So that's totally trivial. So now what about Poincaré sections? They're very easy because what one does in this three-disc period is one takes three circles in a plane, which I'll again draw in some kind of perspective. So this is a plane. So it's a table. And uh, there are three disks of equal radius. They're identical, but you can give them names just for yourself, but physically they're the same. And there, on the points of equilateral triangle, so they're equidistantly spaced from each other, have the same radius. And each one of them has its own Poincaré section, which is very simple. It's just a cylinder that they fit around this circle in the plane, and it's cylinder whose width outside of the plane is from minus one to one and zero. And there are three of these cylinders. So you can visualize that, right? So it's a little bit abstract, but it's easy. What you have to do is, every time you hit the wall, you have to record the cosine uh, of the angle or sine of the angle and uh, plot it in this vertical direction. And that means that you can now have three Poincaré sections. And I told you that it doesn't say in the Bible that there is only one Poincaré section for a problem. As a matter of fact, some scripture probably says that there is some number of them hopefully finite number of sections to capture the physics that you need. And you can see this is obvious here because you'll be bouncing between different parts of this one, uh, you know, three disconnected Poincaré sections. So there'll be three disks. This will be what we call Poincaré section three. This guy will be a Poincaré section two. And this guy will be a Poincaré section Poincaré section two. And each one of them will have perimeter, so variable s, curvilinear distance, will be just, you can think of it as an angle, but it'll be just something that goes from zero to two pi to run around the perimeter. And the momentum will run from minus one to one, all three of them. And what you'll have to keep track of is, and that's why you keep this, put these labels, is that as you shoot from here to here, you will uh, have a point from here that maps to a point there. So you can keep track of it. But now you realize this seems a little bit stupid because they look identical. The disks are identical. So why am I looking at three Poincaré sections? There might be something smarter to do. That's called symmetry reduction, and that will be 
the focus of what we study next week in the course. And this is the simplest example of it, and again, you understand everything. And the idea of symmetry reduction will be, that will sound a little bit formal, but that's a kind of general theory. What you will do is you will quotient, or many other words like symmetry reduce and God knows what. You will quotient this by the symmetry group. They'll turn out to be six different ways of labeling these disks. So very simple symmetry group. And what that will do is it will replace these three Poincaré sections by one. So what we will do, we'll actually just live in a Poincaré section, which will be only one Poincaré section for the problem, going from zero to two pi, and minus one to one in momentum space. And if I look at, for example, this scattering here, there'll be a point in this Poincaré section. And if I hit the next disk, that will show up in one of these two other copies, but I'll just bring that copy back and overlay it. That's called quotient in the group. And I'll have thing that when I look at point S, and N is the end bounds, so discrete time, because this is a map now, not anymore continuous time flow, we quotient at the time. So we'll have S and P and, and then that will land someplace else. This different position and different angle on the other disk. We'll put it, bring it back in, and that'll be called S n plus one, P n plus one. And it'll turn out that when you look at Poincaré section, you will understand everything about the flow. If you look at bouncing between three disks from above and look at the orbits, it'll become an unintelligible jumble very quickly. Another thing that this is a nice example of, to be able to play this game well, you have to have ball bouncing in between because every time it escapes between these two guys, you'll get to the edge of the table and fall down. So there'll be a property called escape. And one of the amazing things we'll be able to do you can do a simulation and you can find out what fraction of balls, if I start with random initial balls, what fraction of them survives until the next bounce, and what fraction escapes. The fraction that escapes, its logarithm is called escape rate. It's a number of balls you lose per bounce. So if you're playing a very bad game and you're not trying to control your shot, it'll tell you how they escape. This is something that it's called molecular dissociation in chemistry or uh, fission in nuclear physics. It's a very common problem, but here you really understand what it is. And if you run a computer, you'll be able to compute two digits of this escape rate. If you listen to us and attend the second part of this course, we compute it to 140 digits. And uh, if you give us money, we'll compute it to 2,800 digits. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it just shows you that the theory not only you know, gets you a little bit. If you understand something, you can do things better orders of magnitude. Now, we don't care about this very much when we're playing pinball because you know, a good enough is few percent estimate of how good players we are. We care about it very much when we're doing quantum physics because there we actually measure things with very high accuracy. And the billiards, you know, quantum billiards are also interesting. So it sort of sets. Also we care about in celestial mechanics. You know, some things we have to know with very high accuracy, we won't be able to control.